great time. Yes, sir. Do you see that? So, folks, um, we've we've been s steeping in in uh, in healthcare reform, and and really um, had a chance to s see it in action at the To Help Everyone Clinic, and now we're going to step back from the the hallways and the waiting rooms and and take a look at um, really the big picture um, with two uh, formidable thinkers um, and actors um, around health policy. And um, just looking at the road ahead and where we're going, and um, and what are the challenges and uh, what are the the pressure points where things could could either um, you know be surpassed or or really stop stop things from from moving ahead. And so we have uh, joining us um, Jerry Kaminsky, who's the director of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. And uh, we were chatting a little bit uh, earlier, and he reflected that uh, he had several life milestones that he remembered. Um, at nine years old, he saw the Beatles in Baltimore. OK? Pretty good. And he, he, he knew about the Beatles, uh, and he wanted to go because of the song, She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand. I just want you to you know, realize how important and savvy of a person this was at age nine. <laughs> and, and, and then at age 10, Medicare was enacted. And um, I, I just asked Dr. Ross, and he said at age eight, when Medicare was enacted, he was probably watching Rin Tin Tin. So, um, you know, fast, fast forward, and, and a few things have happened in, in both of their lives. Um, you know, um, uh, Jerry Kaminsky says in, in describing his, his life's work in, in health policy and research um, at UCLA that social progress doesn't happen because it's the right thing to do, and that he sees what he's doing as really informing and uh, influencing a, a mass audience. And one of the things that his research center is doing is uh, doing the number crunching that's uh, informing all the policymakers about how well we're doing with all the numbers in California. And that's just one of many areas of research at UCLA on health policy. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned, he's really, he and his uh, colleagues are really great sources for you um, as you embark on your health policy stories. And, and Dr. Ross, you know, he grew up in the projects of New York and then um, cut his teeth as a pediatrician, um, you know, during the crack e epidemic in Philadelphia. And so, um, some of his uh, formative experiences as a young doctor looked at um, how everything else that's going around along around you is going to really influence uh, your health. Um, as we were discussing today um, about the what what do you do with the patients who are uh, dealing with substance abuse? You know, can you counsel them? Can you improve their mental health? No, you know, from from Neil Martin. Um, so um, the, these are some of the things that really led him to think about. Um, all the other things that are uh, going on in addition to uh, health care reform. And if you look at the work that the endowment has done, on the one hand, it's invested um, 300 million in the outreach and other work that will help make health care reform uh, succeed in California, but there's also a huge body of work and investment in community health. And I know that he's going to be talking about that today as well, and hopefully give us a little bit of a uh, insight into why he's flying to Washington to meet with the president tomorrow morning as well. And um, I asked Anna. It's a typical day at the office. <laughs> <laughs> or you, maybe. <laughs> I asked Anna, who we've all spent some time with, um, you know, uh, why uh, she's doing what she did, and uh, she does. And she mentioned that her mother was a cop reporter, which is kind of cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. And, um, and that, um, yeah. you know, that she's got a, an activist heart beating beneath her suit too. So uh, that she wants to really uh, help people understand things and help make change. And so I think um, there's a, a group that's sharing a lot right here on the stage. And, and I think uh, probably um, some of you would, would maybe say some similar things to, uh, to Anna about your mission. So I hope that this conversation will be productive in, in getting you all on your way. And I'm going to turn it over to Anna to get us going. Thank you. Can everybody hear? OK. So we are incredibly lucky to have both of these gentlemen here. They are both incredibly involved and influential in the world of healthcare in California and health policy and public health. 
Uh, and I feel very lucky because both of them have uh, helped my career in many ways. The very first week of covering health for the LA Times, I went to meet with Dr. Ross. He probably doesn't even remember this, but uh, he just rattled off a list of story ideas for me, and I think I did every single one. They were so great. And then uh, Dr. Kaminsky, my first week at the at my new job at Kaiser Health News, he gave me the tip about the cancellation letters coming out. And we all know where that story went. So thank you to both of you. Uh, so we're going to jump right in. They're both going to talk uh, for about five minutes and just kind of give an introduction to what they're doing and what are some of the most important things on, on the agenda for them as we move forward with the Affordable Care Act. And then I'm going to ask some questions, and then we're going to open it up to you. So with that, let's jump right in. Uh, Dr. Ross, do you want to begin? Uh, <coughs> sure. Thank, thank you, Anna. Thank you. Um, uh, I mean, congratulations on your new role at, at Kaiser Health News, but um, certainly miss you at the LA Times. Um, and uh, Anna was a, a great journalist, well, still is. Um, but but not not because you did puff pieces about us, but because you got under the hood of of these health issues with um, texture, um, which is something that uh, we like to see our readers um, and the public get. And so uh, appreciate um, your work, and of course um, Jerry and, and the great work at UCLA, um, the center. Um, we're still supporting you guys. Uh, I think so. A little bit. Pretty heavily. Pretty heavily. Last um, time I okay. Um, I have a pie chart that I can show you. That, that should be bigger with our color, right? Yes. Um, but uh, just great work uh, from UCLA and, and um, um, Jerry. You know, when you, when you when when Jerry Center puts out a report, it's you know it, it's bankable in terms of of its um, accuracy and and quality, and and that's why we support um, the kind of work that they do um, in Sacramento. It it um, it gets attention. And then finally, Michelle uh, Lavander, our great friend, and and the great work that's done here at Edinburgh. So. Uh, thank all of you for being interested and passionate um, in the issue. Um, for us, uh, I'm glad, uh, Michelle, you brought up the issue of, of Medicare and Medicaid uh, because for us uh, at the California Endowment, and for me personally, um, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, which is the biggest thing easily to happen in a healthcare system, I think Jerry would agree, in 50 years and a half century. And probably the biggest thing that will happen for at least another 20 or 30 more. Um, I can't imagine anything this big being tried um, by anyone who has watched what has happened to President Obama uh, in trying to do this. I mean, no, no, no politician in their right mind would try and do anything uh, in health care on this scale again. So uh, we feel the urgency. It, this is sort of a one and probably a 75 to 80 year shot um, to get the health care system better. Um, maybe not perfect, but better. Um, secondly, uh, the orientation I, I come at it is, is this is the unfinished business of uh, the civil rights movement. Um, I know it may not seem that way because we're just talking about insurance, uh, but uh, we very much take on uh, a lens of social change, social justice through health, health justice, health equity. And so we see this as a, as a critical um, uh, issue there. And then, and then um, um, lastly, um, well, let me just shift to, to, the, to the, the big three uh, uh, frames, important frames for me, one of which is an easy one, to, and, I'll, and I'll just dispense with that one quickly. Uh, what the Affordable Care Act does uh, in a very powerful and compelling way, and, and, and for some reason in our nation, we got desensitized to how unjust and unfair and un-American this was. Um, but we got rid of the pre-existing condition, okay. which if you think about it, uh, we just kind of glossed over that one, right, <laughs> <laughs> in Obamacare. But... Uh, to actually punish someone because they had the audacity to get sick and discriminate against them in the insurance industry was un-American. And, and why our nation tolerated that for so long is a head-scratcher for me. Uh, but it really was uh, uh, just uh, extremely uh, and extraordinarily uh, discriminatory 
and un-American in its practice. And so just getting rid of that is like a really good start. Mm -hmm. um, that's number one. Number two, um, the affordability aspect, of course, um, both through um, the exchanges, um, using good old-fashioned American competition um, to, to try and control um, costs and make uh, the purchase of coverage more affordable, but then also the expansion of Medicaid. Um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court said that that was an optional thing to do for the states. So, um, I don't know, 30 states have said no, thank you very much, and maybe 19 or 20 states have said yes. Jerry probably it's knows his numbers. 25 each now. 25 each now. Yeah, okay, good. So. Um, but, um, you know, the expansion of Medicaid is also a, a big deal, um, and, and, and it's important. And then thirdly, um, it, it helps uh, provide uh, kind of the, the two by four whack across the head of the healthcare system to give it a jolt that it needs um, to get fixed. Um, and so if in fact, uh, the, the trick there is that the Affordable Care Act and the exchanges in particular, which I'm on, on the board of Cover California Exchange, that has to work in order to create a platform to lever more change, mm -hmm. right? And so those changes might be, and we can come back to this at any point during the discussion, Anna, um, from, you know, what you saw at THC Clinic um, today, you know, what proportion of the um, currently underserved or, or previously underserved um, in those communities or communities like that uh, are duly diagnosed, are, are comorbid, or have two chronic diseases plus um, alcohol problem? Um, how do we get at, at reducing some of the savage inequities in, in racial and ethnic um, disparities, uh, in, in cancer, in stroke, in diabetes, um, in obesity? Uh, so we're really interested in how the Affordable Care Act gives us a platform to make the healthcare system uh, become more prevention oriented and equity minded in its orientation. We can talk about what the opportunities might be to do that, uh, leave in suspense. Um, and so those are three uh, extraordinary reasons to, uh, if you've been in this business of, of um, um, the grease fire that our healthcare system has been over the last um, 30 years, um, uh, you know, I feel like we're in the Super Bowl now. This mm -hmm. is this is our shot to fix mm -hmm. it. And and uh, if Obamacare fails, in my view, uh, which I don't think it will, but but if it did, um, at least our foundation, we go single payer. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's where we go next because there's no there's no market way <laughs> to fix this other than Obamacare. And I know the Obamacare haters uh, think that's a pile of nonsense. But, you know, Obamacare was just Romney care in federal drag. That, that's really, it's, it's a, it's, it actually has more Republican ideas and market ideas than it has um, progressive ideas. The biggest sort of progressive idea was Medicaid expansion. The rest of it is all straight ahead affirmation that we should have a private health insurance system with market principles. That's what, Mark, that's what Obamacare is. So that's why if, if that thing doesn't work, then, then I go to my board of directors and we say, okay, it's single payer time. Um, not that we can snap our fingers and get that to happen, right. Right. but 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 that becomes the next best idea yeah. for us. So, with that, I'll stop and hand it over to my good friend Jerry. Yeah. So I'll just you know sort of continue in the same vein uh, with the you know sort of my perspective, which is I've been one of the reasons we, we were talking about the the uh, anniversary 50th anniversary of Medicare coming up in 2015, and um, the 50 years that uh, has transpired since then is uh, both. Uh, on a personal level, just this uh, sense of awe that 50 years has just gone by. I mean, I, I, I do remember the enactment of Medicare, not because I was a nine-year-old studying health policy, <laughs> but I was a nine-year-old sure. nine who was interested in world what was going on in the world. And I paid attention. I did watch the news, and I had a curiosity. Um, and I knew that things were happening. And um, I didn't quite understand them all. Um, but I was curious about what was going on in the world, and it seemed like a lot uh, was happening for the good, but we needed a lot of things to change in the 60s, and anybody who lived through the 60s knows that um, a lot of change did occur. 
Um, we are still fighting those battles. I think I was glad to hear you say, Bob, that this is really a continuation of, of um, civil rights um, movement because I absolutely agree with you, and I emphasize that point a lot in my public speaking on the ACA, that this is a continuation of the civil rights movement um, and the social justice that began 60 years ago and more in this country. Um, it's interesting to me to see that the um, Kaiser Family Foundation, which is publishing, um, continues to do monthly opinion polling ar around the ACA. Uh, when they ask their more detailed questions about what Americans are concerned about, that there's strong bipartisan support uh, among uh, their um, uh, the people that they interview, and uh, that we should be doing more to address poverty in this country. The ACA is doing that. It is quite clear that the ACA, through subsidies, will be addressing in a very direct way poverty in the United States. It may not be the only way to address poverty, but it is one mechanism for doing that. And yet, we know that there's tremendous opposition. So this inconsistency that uh, roughly 66% of uh, survey respondents to that, bipartisan uh, respondents and support, are saying that the U.S. government, the federal government, should be doing more to combat poverty. And yet, the opposition, we know that right now that there appears to be less than a majority support for the ACA, that even among liberals, um, support has eroded over the last two years. Um, and part of that is because liberals are beginning to feel burned, and that uh, we supported a compromise, which was a market down the middle of the road compromise that's been characterized as socialism and, and, and um, government takeover of the American health care system. This is rhetoric that was used in the 1930s against proposed national health insurance at the time. It gets dusted off the shelf, and it still seems to resonate 70 or 80 years later. But this notion that somehow the Affordable Care Act is a radical transformation of the U.S. health care system is just nonsense. It's very middle of the road. And as a result, the reason we're seeing an erosion of liberal support is that people are feeling burned. They say, well, look, the president tried to be moderate, tried to compromise, um, and has been lambasted for six years now for attempting to do that and characterized as not compromising whatsoever. So a number of people that I talk to feel that, all right, if this doesn't work, we are, we're just going to go to single payer. And it's not going to be an easy, because if you think that the Affordable Care Act is socialism, wait until we have the social discussion around the single payer system, Medicare for all. You can characterize it any way that you want, but it will make what we've seen the last five or six years look like a picnic. Um, it will be bloody, and it's unfortunate that we're at a point in history where we seem to be so fundamentally divided over these issues. Um, I, I tell my students at UCLA, uh, and part of my comment to Michelle about a social change doesn't happen because it's the right thing, uh, we have got to continue to fight, and this is what I tell my students, for there to be progress, because every step that we take forward um, there are mobilized movements, forces, stakeholders who want to push back uh, and prevent any of the progress that we've seen. And it has taken us 50 years to get to this point. I agree with Bob's statement that it could be another 30 years before we have another major health care reform. And I think that that's part of the, the point of the opposition. The opposition, whether they win this battle, they're taking a very long-term strategy, aren't they? And if you can make somebody pay day in and day out for proposing a modest reform to the health care system, just imagine who's going to want to tackle a more fundamental reform. It takes a lot of courage. Um, and um, uh, we, I think we've seen that courage in the president. Uh, but it is an ongoing battle. Um, so as far as you know, where we go from here, I'm going to be giving a, I've been asked to give a talk in a few weeks um, at UCLA, and I'm, I'm going to use it as an opportunity to reflect on 
some of these bigger issues with regard to the Affordable Care Act as opposed to the data, which we've been at UCLA very involved in, and we've been working with Covered California uh, extensively under contract for the last two years to produce estimates of the eligible population in California as well as the likely enrollees in Covered California. And we can talk a little bit during Q&A about how our uh, projections, um, how we've been faring. Um, and uh, the, I, the good news is that looks like we were on target, and as a result, Covered California has been on target. Uh, our estimates were right in the right ballpark, and Covered Fa Ca California seems to be meeting those, those targets um, and exceeding them. So we're very happy about that. Um, but I was saying that I'm going to be giving a talk that's a little bit more reflective in a few weeks at UCLA on, on where ACA fits in this historical sort of progression towards a more equal and universal access in the United States. And I, the subtitle of the talk is, is 2014 the year that we turn the corner? You know, I'm basically an optimist. Um, and maybe some people would characterize me as a little Pollyannish at times, um, looking at things a little bit too much with rose-colored glasses. I thought that once the exchange opened and had the success that it's had, that a number of these the opponents would sort of, they'd just be quieter. And instead, it seems that, that um, there are new opportunities every day for new issues uh, to fight on and to fight about uh, with regard to the Affordable Care Act. Midterm elections. Yeah, midterm elections, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So maybe when the midterm elections are over, but maybe not. Maybe then we're looking to 2016 and another Republican who's going to campaign on repealing the Affordable Care Act. Who knows? But I think that, that if history has taught us nothing else, if, it's, if it took us 50 years to take this step, that those of us who support this law and support a more equal health care system and the next generation and the next generation are going to have to continue to fight to maintain what we've achieved in the last few years. And it's still, you know, under a unlikely but possible scenario, all of this could unravel uh, in a couple years, depending on which way the country goes politically. Um, any number of circumstances could lead to all of the progress that we've made in the last few years going in a different direction. I don't think that that will happen. Um, but I on a daily basis continue to be um, uh, surprised at the depth of the opposition to this law. And I know that it's not just about health care. It is, it is about civil rights and a more equal society. And I think that the, the depth of passion to keep current inequities in the society is both surprising and troubling to me. But I think it's a fact of America in 2014. So. I'll s sort of stop my comments there. And okay, well, this already sets it up as that we have a lot to talk about in this short discussion. Uh, but if, if next month is, is the end of first or this first pass of enrollment, and it, a lot of people will now have their insurance access and their insurance cards, but in some ways that's just the beginning, right? So if that is the first step when somebody has an insurance card, what is the next? For them and for the state. Yeah. So we um, we we still California. If you're grading on the curve, California's done really well, right? Um, in an absolute basis, we're doing okay. Um, and, and we've got bumps, we've got glitches. And what'll happen is um, this first sort of mini shockwave of, of just getting the exchanges up and running leads to successive ones, right? And so the, the next round is, which, which was not brand new news to us, is, is, is the system ready to absorb, you know, millions of more covered lives, right? Um, from primary care to specialists to uh, whatever. So, you know, you already saw one disruption that the president did, a, a lousy job of educating the public about, which was, well, there, it, it wasn't entirely true 
when you said if you got your coverage and you like your doctor, nothing's going to happen to you not to worry. Well, not really, right? So there was, there was that wave. Then the next wave is going to be people who actually have insurance card and can't get an appointment, right? Um, and so we'll see those stories will be so the next wave um, to come out. Uh, and then there'll be another wave um, after that. But my, my view, um, and, and I hope this doesn't sound too sanguine, my view is this is, the, this is the biggest thing to happen in the healthcare system in half a century. Um, it's going to take us more than four or five months to get it right. Okay. Healthy Families Program, also known as uh, CHIP or S-CHIP, it took us three years to get in rhythm with Healthy Families, to get people sort of enrolled and parents educated. And, and, and then you had Medicare Part D, that, that kind of you know, pharmacy benefit fiasco for the elderly. What year was that, Jerry? Uh, it started in 2006. Uh, 2006. That took us a year. A couple years. To, you know, yeah. to clean that up, right? ACA is 15 times more complicated than either of those. So I get a little bit frustrated with um, the breathless stories that I read in the media and see in the media about, you know, um, oh, my God, uh, the young invincibles aren't enrolling yet in the numbers we need, and Latino enrollment's not where it needs to be yet, and... You know, and I'm looking at my watch and folks, you know, we're, we're 83 days in, you know, give us a minute, right? And I never expected that we'd get this. I was just hoping the thing wouldn't implode out of the gate, right? We're impatient. Like the, you know, like the federal <laughs> website did. Um, we at least uh, did a little bit better than, than limp out. But it's gonna, I think it's going to take us a couple of cycles of enrollment periods to begin to get in rhythm with this new law. It's just too complicated and has too many moving parts. Um, the, the other uh, thing that needs to be done in California, not inside the four walls of the Affordable Care Act, um, Anna, but related to it, and particularly in California, but also a national issue, is what about those left behind, and in particular the undocumented. Right? So part of that commitment that, that we have as a foundation, I'm now switching, I'm taking my California hat on, I'm putting my Cal uh, California Diamond hat on for a moment. Um, as, uh, as Michelle mentioned, what are we investing our dollars in? We're setting aside dollars about the undocumented. Uh, we, we don't know what it's going to take to fix that. A bill has been introduced. Um, but again, because we look at this through the lens of equity, we, we can't just relax because people are getting enrolled and getting to see a doctor. You know, what about those that are left behind? So, uh, again, happy to take any questions about that, but we're looking at the undocumented as well. But so we sure. heard a little bit yeah. about that this morning, and yeah. we can talk a little bit more about that. But what do you see as the next step? So, uh, you know, I, I agree that, you know, the, if the first step is getting the insurance card in the hands of people who, many of whom have not had insurance for years, um, then the next step is to guarantee that they do get adequate access to care. Um, so there are a couple things that have emerged as... Um, issues as a result of the Affordable Care Act. One is the, um, uh, because California has gone beyond the rest of the nation in terms of standardizing the four metal tier policies that are available in the exchange, it means that there are fewer policies uh, available. Um, in many states, there are 80, 90, 100 different policies being offered. They're all the four metal tiers, but they're all minor, tiny variations on a theme. 15 different bronze plans. California has one bronze plan that all insurers have to sell. It has one gold, one platinum, and one silver. And then with the silver, there are different levels of cost sharing uh, as subsidies that are available depending on your income. But California went the extra mile, standardized the co-payments and the, de the deductibles to really allow people to do comparison shopping. and but. If the plans don't vary in their benefits or their co-payments and deductibles, what becomes the most important issue? Well, now it's the network. What doctors and what hospitals? And so Bob's right. California, and we're grading on a curve, is ahead of the rest of the nation, has done an outstanding job. But even in California, the one area where covered California hasn't done as well as it might have or maybe should have is in having those networks readily available so that if that becomes the most important decision, 
once you've decided that a silver plan is the right plan for you, um, that information's got to be available to people. And the doctors have to be available. So I think what we've seen as a result, and by the way, narrow networks are not, were not created as a result of the ACA. I've been in a narrow network at UCLA for a number of years now because I'm in an HMO. And what's happened is my network's become even narrower as a cost-cutting measure, and I'm actually paying less for health insurance to today at UCLA than I was three years ago because the network, the network got narrower. And I actually think that is a good thing for me and it's a good thing for UCLA and UC employees. But the point is, I don't, I don't think there's been a single newspaper story about narrow networks in the private sector because there's not the same degree of transparency that there is now in the health insurance market that is a direct result of the exchange and the fact that we do have transparency in a way that's never existed before in the marketplace. So I think one of the benefits uh, uh, and sort of a spillover benefit of having the exchanges and having transparent insurance products is that it's shedding light on some of these issues that have been taking place kind of quietly in the private sector affecting millions of Californians um, but not necessarily getting the same sort of coverage uh, because it's not necessarily well known unless you're an insider, uh, unless okay. somebody steps forward. I think there's just so much more attention on the insurance industry yes. now than there ever has been before. Oh, absolutely. And I realize that all of us are looking at it through um, very kind of narrow glasses mm -hmm. and focus because this is what we're writing about, many of us. But. Uh, but there's a lot more attention. Do you think on that issue of narrow networks that there will be a bit of a pushback from consumers once they do get their insurance and they realize that they can't go to the hospital or the doctor they wanted to go to well, and that the insurance companies will have to make some changes? Listen, we're, we're hearing some of that, but I think some of that is also, you know, that's, again, the opponents are looking for that and are uh, – using those stories to say, look, see, this is not working. The law is not working because people don't have access to every doctor in their region. They can't just go to any hospital. But, the, you know, this is also a misunderstanding as well. I mean, f first of all, for emergency care, you know, I, I know that USC is not in my network. But if I start experiencing symptoms right now, you know that I'm going there. And my insurance company will pay for that emergency care. So I have access. But if I want to have an elective procedure, then that hospital is not going to be in my network. Do I need to have access to every doctor in Los Angeles County? Um, I can't tell. This is one of the most frequently asked questions from reporters that I've that I've had uh, fielded over the last three months. Um, it most often comes up around Cedars. If Cedars is not in the networks then are people in covered California not getting access to the best care available in Los Angeles County? And my response is that Cedars is an excellent hospital, but when we look at the objective quality measures, they are not across the board more outstanding than any other hospital in this county. And in fact, the one area where they really excel is in patient satisfaction slash customer service. They apparently, do, and I've never been to Cedars as a patient, uh, but apparently they do a really good job of making you feel well cared for while you are in the hospital. And I don't want to dismiss that as an important dimension of, of quality. But if I need heart surgery, what I really want to know is what is the probability that I'm going to survive the surgery and be fully recovered. And the objective data shows that Cedars is as good as a lot of other hospitals in the county. So the fact that they're not in these narrow networks in covered California is not an indication to me that people are getting uh, lower quality care or not getting access to the best care available in Los Angeles County. But the question is on a lot of people's minds because it's right out there. It's in the open now in a way that I, Cedars is not in my network and has, but you know, I work right next to UCLA. so. Yeah, I just, uh, on that one, this falls into a broader um, category of issue. Um, and and when, the pr when the president got in trouble 
for the um, don't worry your pretty little head if you have a doctor and insurance. Nothing's gonna, and when he got in trouble on that one, and I and I, I can imagine I wasn't in the White House, but I can imagine why he didn't. Uh, I know the opponent said he lied to the American public. Um, he hid the ball a little bit, and here's why. Um, here in California and nationally, and part of the problem, my biggest lament about the timing of the Affordable Care Act, although I'm not sure we would have fixed it even if it, if it, if it had been delayed, we've never had a conversation in this country and a discourse landing on what we want our health care system to be when it grows up. Okay. And I'll tell you why that's a problem. Okay. Because the narrow network question is, you know, it comes out of central casting as America, we can't have it all. You can't have it both ways. You can't bitch and moan about the cost of health care and then bitch and moan about narrow networks. Okay, you can't have both. It is impossible. The math doesn't work. Okay, <laughs> and that's that's the conversation that um, I fault the president for. Because even though he's as brilliant a communicator as Bill Clinton, as as Ronald Reagan, when he wants to be, um, and he he skirted that one. He didn't want to have the trade-off conversation with the American public about this is why this. Obamacare plan looks the way it does, America, because we can't have it both. You can't go to every doctor you used to go to anytime you wanted to and bend the cost curve. You can't do both. And here is why I constructed the Affordable Care Act to try and find that balance, right? You can't get all the options and choices you want, but at the same time, you know what? We're going to bend the cost curve. And he never had that conversation with the public, right? He could have had. And I bet someone inside the White House said to him, Ugh, this thing's already on, on right. thin ice. Don't go there telling the truth and everything. Just keep it simple it's too with much these like sound the, bites, Too much right? like the Clinton discussions, the Harry and Louise problem. Right, right. Which they were yeah. determined to oh, avoid. I thought you avoid. were going to say, I never had sex with that woman. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's kind of like that one, no. too. I heard somebody on a, a panel at the at the Insure the Uninsured uh, Project conference last week call them selective networks because they're oh. trying to change the discussion. The discussion that that yeah. it's, yes. this is not a bad thing. Yeah. This is actually a cost saving measure, which which yeah. is what. And, you're and when did we see this before? Is with the HMO backlash. Remember oh. that? I mean, now there's t no one Correct. wants to use the term HMO anymore either, right? Remember the movie? What was the movie with uh, the woman Denzel. who had the asthmatic kid? And, and Denzel, uh, right? No, yeah, not that one. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that one, right? Oh, yes. Re remember right. when, uh, was it Meg Ryan? One of those actresses. And she had a kid with asthma. And, and I was in the theater watching it, and she said, those goddamn HMOs wouldn't see my kid with asthma. And, then, like, there was applause Everybody was, in the yes. theater, right? <laughs> right. And that was, the, you know, the venom at HMOs. But that was, it was the same trade-off conversation. Wait a minute, America, we, can't, we just can't do both. We've got to pick and choose a path. And so, um, uh, because we have failed to have that kind of honest, candid, trade-off conversation with the American public generally, and the California public, um, now it feels like an unresolved issue, or it feels like somebody's hiding the ball, or somebody's trying to pull a fast one. We're just trying to figure out what that balance is between choice and quality and affordability. And, and, and it's, it's, it's not an easy path to, um, to uh, traverse. And large employers are doing it every year. Uh, I sit on a faculty welfare uh, committee campus-wide that looks at this for almost 300,000 people in the state of California who are covered by the University of California system. But because it takes place in private and our, our plans are not available to the general public, you're not going to see the narrowness of the networks that are available to us on a website anywhere. What reason would you have to report on it? or to even think about it, you know? But the point is that, you know, this is what our healthcare system, and I agree completely with Bob's statement that this is the discussion that we should be having, and Anne is right. I mean, this is, you know, the Affordable Care Act is shedding light on some of these issues and focusing our attention in a way that we're not even aware that some of these changes have been going on for years. Unless you study this, the industry, day in and day out and do all of your, 
you know, research on this topic. You know, there are a handful of people in California who are not surprised by this, but the general public is just not aware. No, at my kids' PTA meeting, when people are talking about health insurance, then you know it's really become very common that pe this is what people are interested in thinking about. And, and you make an, a good point about HMOs. I mean, now that is where our healthcare system is. Essentially, I mean, the entire Medi-Cal population almost is on managed care Medi-Cal, which is a public HMO yep. in a sense. But so Diana Dooley, who is the head of the state's Health and Human Services Department, says that uh, that health reform is a three-legged stool. She, I'm sure you've heard her say this many a time, right? It's prevention and wellness, it's the coverage expansion, and it's payment reform. So talking about cost control, what, what do we see or what are we going to see over the next few years in terms of payment reform? How is that going to affect clinics like we went to today and hospitals and doctor's offices? So what we're seeing, and, and you know, this is a trend that began in the Medicare program over 30 years ago. It started at the beginning of my career, and it's what I did my doctoral uh, research on, which is Medicare began, ch fundamentally changed the way that it paid for hospital care back in the early 1980s. It went from a system of paying hospitals their allowed cost to saying, we're going to pay you a fixed amount of money based on the patient's diagnosis, and you're at risk, financial risk, if it costs you more to provide care for this patient. That system of fixed payments based on the patient's diagnosis has been in place under Medicare for 30 years. And what Medicare has done over the last 30 years is increasingly tried to bring all of its, sort of all of the sectors of the healthcare delivery system into what are called bundled payments to try to, rather than pay for every single service that's provided, to provide a, some sort of lump sum payment and make the providers bear some of the risk. The Affordable Care Act accelerates that by promoting accountable care organizations and you know, basically providing an incentive for doctors and hospitals to work together to accept a capitated payment or a bundled payment and to provide inpatient and outpatient care for Medicare beneficiaries. And then for what are known as the pioneer, the more established uh, uh, accountable care organizations, uh, there's the expectation that after three years that these organizations will have the same arrangements with non-Medicare patients as well. So the idea, the payment reform, is that we are bringing people more and more under some sort of bundled uh, payment system and putting the risk on to providers to figure out. Now, the state of Maryland, I was at a, the um, uh, National Health Policy Conference sponsored by Academy Health, which is one of the professional organizations that I've belonged to for, my, for 30 years. And um, at that conference, one of the panelists was talking about change that's taking place in Maryland. Uh, Maryland's had reformed its hospital payment system many years ago and did away with different payment amounts based on different who your insurer was. Maryland for almost 40 years has had a payment system where Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance, all the payments are the same. So when you walk into a hospital in Maryland, it doesn't matter who your insurer is. The bill is the same, and everybody's paying the same amount. So the hospital doesn't have an incentive to see privately insured patients and try to not treat Medicaid patients. Everybody's equal in terms of the financial reward. Maryland now is moving to the next step, which is capitating hospitals and saying, you know, you're responsible for a population in your geographic area. And what this is leading to is hospitals are looking, are partnering with organizations outside to figure out ways to keep people from showing up at the hospital. Because if you've received a fixed payment, a global budget for a defined population, now you have an incentive to keep people healthy and keep them from coming in your door, rather than the incentive that most hospitals face today, which is that, well, we want to get people in the door. Um, we don't want them to come back because we get penalized for readmissions, but we especially like privately insured patients to come in our door because we know we can get paid more than Medicare or Medicaid. So. When you change the payment system and you reform the payment system, it creates, opens up a whole different set of incentives 
Um, it creates waves, it seems. Exactly. In, both in, within the hospital walls and out into the community. And it, it, it makes sense, but it can't happen until the hospital's actually facing that financial risk. And now they're partnering with community organizations to say, what can we do to keep the population that we're responsible for, and we're being paid for, we're being paid up front, but if we can keep people healthy, then that means we can actually make money and have a healthier population. Yeah, if I could fill up uh, two, two, two thoughts on triggered by, Jer by Jerry's comments. So, so one is um, a, a, a sad note around the exchanges because when, when the Affordable Care Act first passed and, and you knew that there was a possibility that each state could run their own exchange, right? Uh, I actually thought that was a, a beautiful thing because you would now have 50 opportunities to do the kind of stuff that Maryland is trying. Right, and, o and over a period of seven, eight, ten years, you learn from one another to see what's working, because you can you can take you can take a health exchange, and you can have sort of a minimalist approach. You could just you know okay, we're just going to do like um, you know cars.com. We're going to be mostly a website. Uh, people can shop, and that's all we're going to do. Right. Or you can use your exchange to do, try and leverage your exchange to do payment reform and delivery reform. Or like, is it Vermont that's thinking about going to single payer, single using payer. their exchange to kind of pivot to single payer, right? But, but having 50 exchanges around the country would give us this really rich, you know, vast, um, innovative uh, laboratories around a common frame known as the, the Affordable Care Act. But because of the politics and so many Republican governors and legislatures saying, you know, take your exchange and shove it, now instead of having 50 opportunities for innovation, we have 19 or 20, whatever the, the number is, right? Um, so that's, that's one thing that leaves me um, I'm kind of sad about that. The, the second is, and I'll, I'll say something to you that maybe you already know, but just to, to tee up the point. Uh, so public health research tells us that 70 to 80 percent of what, of what influences our life expectancy and our quality of health life has nothing to do with health care. Right. And, you know, good data, research, some of it coming from these guys shop and, and what has become a moniker for us. Um, you know, if you, want, if you want to tell me, if you want, to, if you want me to predict your life expectancy within some reasonable statistical likelihood, tell me your zip code and I'll tell you how long you're going to live. Right. Because the zip code in, in, in Compton and the zip code in Beverly Hills have very fundamentally different life expectancies, right? And that happens in Detroit and, and I mean, so it happens all around the country. So the kind, what, what Jerry was getting at was how do we begin to use the Affordable Care Act to lever and move towards more population-based, community-based, community enveloped approach of, of community health, which is what we call public health. How do we use some of the prevention and wellness advantages in the Affordable Care Act to, to advance and promote prevention? And how do we begin to make the turn from the American healthcare system, which is still really, it's not, it's, it's not a health system, it's a disease system. It's a sickness system. With payments incentivized by how many services you can provide because someone's really sick, right? And ring up the cash register um, the sicker they are for all the services you bill. And so the combination of Obamacare and the pressures to bend the cost curve, you're seeing this battle all over the place around things such as bundled payments and narrow networks, um, CEDARS. The CEDARS thing is very interesting to watch, really interesting to watch. Because CEDARS run by experienced, highly regarded, highly respected um, CEO named Tom Prisilak. And Tom um, has said, you know, we'll kind of go on our own here. He's betting that the CEDARS reputation in the community, particularly in the West Side, you know, the hospital to the stars, is going to carry it through, its rock, through this rocky period. And they can survive not being sort of in these networks. Um, and so if, if you're going to sort of watch a mini vignette on this big drama and saga, watch what happens with 
with Cedar sinai over the next couple of years, um, and whether, and, and Tom's a, a good friend, but, but whether there's a new CEO at Cedars <laughs> <laughs> with a new attitude, or whether Tom is still there and they've sort of, you know, uh, ridden out the storm. Um, but, 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 but this issue of, of cost control has got to shift more towards a prevention and wellness frame, and that's another one of the, the sagas and battles that, that the ACA is going to um, trigger. So to that point, what is there within ACA that, that will drive health equity, that will drive a, an elimination or reduction of some of the health disparities that we witnessed and heard about at, at a place uh, in South LA this morning? Yeah, and, and uh, a quick reaction and then and, and, and Jerry. I, I think um, it depends on how bold and courageous we are to use the opportunity and the platform of ACA, particularly the exchange, but, but outside of the exchange, to actually address those issues, right? So again, going back to the earlier example, you can run a health exchange, you can implement the ACA legally and, and just do, you know, healthcare.shop, right? Um, and, and just sort of reduce it to a website and, 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 and sort of see where that goes. Or you can say at Cover California, we've incorporated values and principles around using the opportunity of the exchange to lever um, uh, reductions in inequities. Now, I'll give you one concrete example. So one is, is the integration and the advancement of behavioral health, okay, substance abuse treatment and mental health. There is greater mental health parity under the Affordable Care Act, right? Are we going to get serious about advancing and promoting integrated primary care behavioral health, integrated substance abuse and mental health services treatment, parity in mental health? Are we really going to put pedal to the metal in driving that forward? Are we going to say, eh, we'll just kind of see what happens here, right? And so knowing that, particularly in communities of color, Underserved communities, um, women, uh, at some point, if you guys, they didn't know about the Kaiser study, the uh, ACES study, they know about that? We haven't we'll, talked about ACES, we had Barbara Staggers here from Children's Okay, Children's if we have time, we'll, I'll, I'll mention ACES, but, but the, the role that trauma and toxic stress and anxiety plays in America's healthcare system, in Compton, but even in Beverly Hills is pretty substantial, okay? If you go to a women's prison and you ask a group of 20 women, which I've done, uh, how many of you have been physically or sexually abused? All the hands go up. If you go to a women's alcohol and drug treatment center and you ask how many of you have been physically or sexually abused as kids, 80% of the hands go up, right? And so wh whether we're willing to take that issue on through the lever of the Affordable Care Act and more wellness, more prevention, more mental health priority, more integrated uh, uh, delivery systems, more health homes uh, around high risk and vulnerable populations and patients. You know, how courageous are we going to be in pushing that versus uh, being somewhat passive? And I think that's, you know, watch us carefully to see whether we, we, we um, execute on the values and principles that we discussed. But, so let me ask you a question, Dr. Pence. So sure. your, your shop has tracked very closely this early expansion of Medi-Cal here in California right. that was referred to this morning, the Low Income Health Program, or LIP. Right. And one of the most um, fascinating studies that came out, I thought, was the ER use, right? How it went up a little bit, but then over the long term yeah. dropped. Yeah. So do you think that that is what we will see with the rest of this newly insured population? Oh, I absolutely do. And um, so, you know, right now I think the we've been sort of wringing our hands at the center because we feel like we've been scooped a little bit by the Oregon, uh, Oregon study, uh, which seems to indicate that after one year, you know, healthcare spending goes up as a result of being on Medicaid. And, and um, that's led to a lot of, uh, of concern that um, ACA and the Medicaid expansion in particular is going to be a failure. It's going to be more costly without any necessary improvement in health. Uh, first of all, in one year, it's very difficult to show significant increases in most health improvement measures. Um, the fact that utilization went up is consistent with our findings. But, you know, we've looked at 
there are 10 counties in California that we've been looking at for seven years uh, that participated in an expansion program that was the precursor to the low-income health program, which was a bridge to Medicaid expansion. And it, our findings are very consistent in those counties that there is an increase in utilization for the first 12 to 18 months that does drop off. There is, you know, there are pent-up demand for health care services among chronically uninsured populations, but they catch up relatively quickly. And by the way, there's similar evidence in the Medicare population. Um, several excellent studies that were done five or six years ago that apparently uh, at least some people in the research community have amnesia about that showed that individuals who were uninsured in the years leading up to Medicare eligibility suddenly got dramatic, first of all, when they became eligible for Medicare, did have a more uh, dramatic increase in utilization of services than people who were consistently insured. But, and also at the time they entered Medicare, their overall health status was lower, but they were able to catch up in a few years. Not in year one, but within three to four years, their health status improved as a result of having access to regular health care. So I have every reason to believe that we're, we're, we'll see the same thing. Um, we've seen it in the 640,000 people who were in the low-income health program who are now in Medicaid. Um, and I think it's, that's a great story. It's a great success story for, for California. It's a great success story for the 640,000 people who were in the low-income health program. Um, and what it means is that the Medicaid expansion, in a sense, we, we, have a, we had a down payment on it. It means that those 640,000 individuals are actually going to be less expensive. Because they've already done, they've gone already, through that. They've gone through that sort of bump in demand uh, when they were enrolled in the, the, the LIP program, as we call it, low-income health program. So before we open it up to, uh, to questions from you all, I think, Dr. Ross, you should tell us why you are meeting with the president tomorrow yes. and what you are unveiling about black men and, and boys. Yeah, so this is another sort of, this is a chapter in the, in the larger book of, of, um, of health inequities in the, in the country. Um, and so th there are a number of, of populations and subpopulations that are not only vulnerable, but particularly vulnerable, right? Uh, and among them are uh, young men of color, uh, in particular uh, African-American men, um, around issues of, of achievement, uh, school achievement and wellness. So, uh, you know, one, one out of every three black male babies born in this country is going to spend time in prison. Um, you've got homicide rates in young black males that are 12, 13, 14 times higher than their white counterparts. Black men are being incarcerated at eight to nine times um, the rate of, of white male counterparts. Uh, Latinos high also, although not quite as high as the African American population and community. Uh, then you have, you have, you actually have, um, even though there, there's still sort of the, 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 the myth of the, um, um, of, of, of Asians as the perfect minority, you, you have subpopulation groups in the Asia Pacific Islander um, communities that, that have uh, equally bad uh, and poor um, outcomes in terms of dropout rates, incarceration rates, um, homicides, uh, uh, violence issues. And so we as a foundation, we've been concerned about this issue and we uh, are part of a group of around 25 foundations around the country doing some work around the crisis of, of young, um, young men of color. Uh, we've been in a conversation back and forth with um, officials from the White House for about four or five months, um, starting with, um, it was right after the, um, after, it, was, it was right after the Trayvon Zimmerman verdict, where all of a sudden our phone began to ring from the White House, when we frantic White House staff saying, oh my God, the president wants to do something, what should we do? Uh, so we got called and others got called. Um, we had a conversation with the president um, uh, in, I think, I think I want to say that was October. Um, okay. Mary Lou, was that October? October, November? Um, and and it, was, it was really, it was very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to see what he says tomorrow, because tomorrow he's going to unveil his um, strategy. He's going to call the program uh, My Brother's Keeper. Uh, but 
um, I got a dose of, of how, how important this is to him because um, we, uh, we met in the Roosevelt Room, which is one of those historic rooms um, in the West Wing. And um, it was about eight or nine foundation presidents. And um, the meeting started with um, Valerie Jarrett and Eric Holder and Arnie Duncan and Cecilia Munoz, who's the domestic policy advisor. And even though we were told that the president was going to be there, I didn't think he was going to be there because he was having a horrible week. <laughs> I mean, talk about a bad day. He was NSA, Egypt, Syria, Obamacare was screwed <laughs> up. I said, man, there's no way we're going to see this brother today. <laughs> it's just, you know. So the um, president shows up, and I'm thinking, okay, maybe he'll be here five minutes, and then he's got to go off to you know, deal with whatever. And he, we had him for an hour and a half. You know, and he and he talked. It, it was the it was the the president that we saw in the Trayvon Martin George Zimmerman speech. It was that President Obama who showed up, saying, you know, this is unacceptable. And what he said in so many words was, "Don't expect me to bring a boatload of federal dollars requested for this population, meaning you know, black and brown boys, but I'll do whatever I can, you know, beyond that." I could see what he was saying was. Listen, this is a Congress that's cutting food stamps for the elderly. Right, exactly. Then I'm not, they're not going to approve a, a $3 billion aid package for black boys. Ain't going to happen. But I'll use the bully pulpit of my office to do whatever I can, corporate support, public-private partnerships. I'll do an executive order, whatever, right? So we'll find out what that means tomorrow. But that is, um, he's having an event to unveil his sort of public-private partnership there. Um, and what it means for us is we're looking at what are the health and education, health and schooling opportunities to identify young men who are getting in trouble early, and how do we rally um, around them with, with preventing or leave intervention <coughs> strategies. And so we're pretty excited. I'll be taking the red eye tonight, um, and uh, we'll see what happens. I wonder what the response will be, I think. It, it, it'll be uh, the usual blowback from the right, how dare he pick this population, how dare he, right? You know, I mean, he'll get, he'll get killed for that. Um, and then from the left, it'll be, how come he's not asking Congress for $8 billion? Right. And it'll and, be the rest fighting, of us. Right, and fighting, right, to the death. You know, you saw how Tavis Smiley and, and Cornell West just been, you know, raining on the president because he's not being black enough as a president, right? So he'll get it from both ends. And we'll be in the middle trying to say, okay, what can we get done? And Dr. Ross, you wrote an uh, op-ed piece, right, in the Times yeah. recently about that. So yeah. you should, you all should check that out. So let's open it up. There's lots of things to talk about. I have a question. If we could switch just real quickly to quality of care. Um, under the Affordable Care Act, there, there are a, a number of initiatives from the CMS Office of uh, Innovations, and there was a billion or two billion dollars going to this, uh, what do they call it, hospital engagement network project that brought thousands of American hospitals together to try to improve quality of care. Do you see, it's been almost two years since that went into effect, do you expect to see any improvements or significant improvements in that area with the goal being, you know, to bend that cost curve but also to improve quality of care? Yeah, Jerry. yeah you know, it, it, I can't comment specifically on those programs and whether we're going to see the results. I do know that um, CMMI, uh, that basically the innovation program at CMS, is really geared, first of all, there's uh, historically unprecedented levels of funding. We haven't seen this kind of funding for this sort of change um, in decades. So there's a there are a lot of resources. And they've really tried to target programs that are going to show quick returns. Um, and I know this because we participated in one or two proposals to um, get this funding uh, here in Los Angeles County. Uh, we were unsuccessful in the, in the uh, teams that we participated, so we're not, we're not uh, participating in any of those innovation grants at this time. But they were really looking for things that could show results in a short period of time. That's the problem. So yeah. I think what you're going to see is something similar to the Pioneer ACOs, right? So there have been organizations around the country that have been trying to, without 
incentives uh, from the federal government per se to try and improve quality by providing more coordinated care uh, because it's the right thing to do. And you know, maybe there's support locally or regionally from large employers. You know, there have been movements across the country, regional efforts uh, that have been going on for 30 years in the United States. So what you're going to see is some of these programs that are already relatively advanced will get the funding and they will show improvement uh, because in a sense they were already 95% there and the additional funding allowed them to show some additional improvement. The real issue is can we scale this up to organizations that are back at ground zero who haven't begun to think about how to function in a coordinated care environment or an accountable care type of environment who are simply focused on how can we maximize our revenue, what can we do to survive in a largely fee-for-service or PPO-like environment. We don't want to take managed care contracts if we don't have to, et cetera, et cetera. That's the, the question. Can we it, you know, provide an incentive for reform and for higher quality in organizations that say, you know, quality is a good thing. We don't want to have a bad reputation. But we can also do just fine without being the best on the block. And it's, I always tell reporters it's kind of, it's an odd, it's an odd industry. It's a very <laughs> odd industry. You know, most American sectors of the economy, if you don't continue to excel and improve, you lose market share. And in healthcare, you can kind of be mediocre and still do, still stay in business. See, this um, is, if I can, just on that point, this is one of the, the, the operative questions on the, what do we want our healthcare system to be when it grows up, right? Yeah. Because if, if you could say to yourself, okay, um, here's what America, or in this case California, is, is really willing and prepared to spend. Um, here are the key measures to uh, address whether we're actually healthier as a state. Um, Here's how we're going to measure quality, and here, here's what the report card kind of looks like. Right? And, by the way, if we agree that those are the things we want, how are we going to use payment reform to drive towards that? Right. Right? And so that's, that's the disconnect that, that we haven't sort of figured out yep. yet, that now we're, we're, we're yep. running like hell to try and figure it out. Um, but we should have had that question answered before the ACA. Because then we could have said, okay, ACA is coming in. Now we know we know what we want to achieve, and 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 the quality thing is is a weird thing, man. I mean, quality means a lot of different things. It, you know, to your grandmother, and to my mother, quality is kind of different, right? Did the doctor take time? Did he say hello? Was he or she nice? You know, I, you know, was the room clean? That's those things don't necessarily show up in the heatest measures, right? I mean, so. <laughs> you have to some that come to some Edith consensus. Measures being the clinical results, yeah. the outcome. Right, right. And this is why, with the, the, Jerry mentioned Cedars, and you know, without a real quality data assessment, you would just assume that because you know Kirk Douglas and Barbara Streisand go to Cedar Sinai, they must be the best damn hospital in California. Well, the data doesn't show that. In fact, the data kind of says Cedars has some work to do. So th this is, it's another one of those, the honest, candid trade-off conversation, and, and the quality thing needs to be in it, and we've just averted it. I wonder if people are paying that close attention to quality. I mean, we talked about this with the Covered California deciding to put the quality ratings up. Right. Who, who does? Do they pay more attention to that, or do they pay more attention to, can I get an appointment? Yeah. Right. And is my doctor nice? Yeah. Well, and that's a, an ongoing debate. You, uh, you know, our our field has been producing quality measures for 20 years and working to really get better measurement. Um, but the ongoing challenge is, is it consumers, individuals who are going to use that information? Are we going to shop on quality? Or should it be maybe our employers or maybe Covered California that uses that information to make sure that there's they're good quality providers uh, but, you know, we're not going to use that information because it's too complex. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering what you've, uh, what are you worried about 
after Massachusetts experiment is now in its sixth or seventh year, I think. Six, seven. Uh, well, started in 2006. Six, right. Yeah, so seven. Eight, seven, eight. So I was wondering what what have you seen in in their execution? And um, I've been reading about some results, long long waits, um, and other things. Are there is there something that we can avoid here in California? Is there something that you you think well we're on a different track than they are is what's what's the difference well i think there are a lot of differences you know we i mean massachusetts started with something like 500,000 people uninsured in the state and they've cut that below uh in more th more than in half um california when we started this we estimated that there were about 5.8 million californians on any given day who are uninsured uh, our more, most recent estimates that aren't in the numbers that you saw earlier today because they haven't been publicly released through Covered California, but we've been continue to update our estimates. And we think that in, because of the lower premiums in California than what we originally expected, uh, and because of the, in a sense, the, the better success that we're having in terms of enrolling uninsured people, that we could be down to two and a half million uninsured Californians in three years. So, but that's still a lot of people. So California is gonna have a unique set of challenges. Um, and even in that remaining two to two and a half million uninsured, uh, maybe 800,000 are undocumented and not eligible for benefits under ACA. So we've got, you know, another challenge that those 800,000 individuals are, you know, almost twice as many as Massachusetts started with. Um, we have a different geography, um, a, a different sort of market orientation, um, a much higher degree of HMOs uh, than in Massachusetts. So uh, it's, I think, actually one of the, the strengths of the ACA that allows for, and, and there's certainly an argument to be made that more uniformity in the ACA would have prevented states from kind of trying to subvert the implementation of the law. But at least the fact that there is allowance for state variation means that California can do some of the things that nobody else is doing um, and uh, meet the challenges uh, in a way that's unique to California. And I, it, it's, you know, honestly, it's a pleasure to live in a state where there's an attitude that this is an opportunity to get things right and to use this as a transformative model as opposed to we'll do the minimum necessary to comply with the law. We'll take the money, we're happy to take the money, but we'll do as little as possible other than just funnel it and you know hope that people get the coverage that they need. So, <clears throat> you agree with, with Jerry's points. I, um, what we're in, a, in the process of doing, we're, we're fixing the coverage crisis, and then we're going to create an access crisis, a different kind of access crisis. So the first access crisis we had was people who didn't have health insurance cards or coverage, right? Now we're going to have people with coverage who can't get care, right? I mean, that's going to be the next wave, and right? And will that safety net be strong enough to... And to then create? the safety net of what happens to the THEs right. of the world and all that stuff. So I know this is going to sound horrible, um, but I've been in this state too long, and, I, and, and, I've, and I've worked with and for elected officials too long, where you get kind of... J and I'm an optimist too, but you get kind of jaded because nothing gets fixed unless it's a crisis, right? And so the access, the new access crisis we're going to have which is people with coverage who can't get in, right, um, is going to be fixed because we'll have another wave of hard choices to make that up until now have been politically unattainable, right? So one example is uh, if, you want to, uh, if, if you want to change scope of practice regulations so that mid-level practitioners, uh, nurse practitioners, even nurses, um, dental hygienists can do more, right? 
but then you, you begin to erode, you begin to now creep in on what the doctors used to have the sole domain to do, right? Um, be, because um, this is, you could train a cook to do a cardiac cath. I, I, I mean, you know, Don't I mean. tell the CMA that. Of course, of course not. I mean, but te technically, a lot of these Medical procedures. Bobby, you, you know you're on the record. Am I on the record? Oh, scratch that. But you know, my, my point is that, that you know, you, you've, got, you've got institutionalized medicine just beating back any ideas of practice reform, right, which allows for greater opportunities for low-level and mid-level practitioners to do more thereby improving access opportunities to care that's needed and reducing costs, right? But you can't get there from here because of the lobby of the fill in the blank, CMA, CBA, all that, right? Um, and by the way, why does it, why do you, does it really take four years to educate somebody in medical school? I don't know that it really needs to take four years. Can it be done in three? Probably. Which means if you can do it in three rather than four, you're knocking off a year of that debt. That, that those kids are right down the street are inhabiting at UCSD's or, or UCLA's medical school, right? And so why can't we combine, which some places have, why can't you become a doctor and get trained in six years instead of eight? Or in five years instead of seven, right? Is that impossible? That's not impossible, that, that's doable. But you can't get there from here because there's too much sort of political stasis and crustiness around these issues. So in a sense, um, uh, in, a, in a sense, I kind of, this sounds terrible, but I almost welcome the next wave of, of access crisis because it's going to force a level of, of hard decisions that we've been putting off and we need to make about, and this is why you wonder why Cuba and Costa Rica has better life expectancy than the United States of America. It's not because of Botox. And it's not because of the number of plastic surgeons they have. It's because the kind of system they have is a much more community-based, prevention, early intervention-minded. They use community health workers. They've been using mid-level practitioners for, for decades. Mm -hmm. And we haven't woken up to the fact there are a whole other continents and countries who spend a third of what we spend and get better life expectancy. So how does that work? So, so it's, it's kind of, we're going to have to see this next wave, we're going to walk through this next wave of crisis to get the kind of legislative and policy support for some of these hard decisions that uh, up until now have been just politically, you know, a fool's errand. We saw that last year yeah. with the scope of practice debates over, there were three pieces of legislation that Senator Hernandez pro, uh, promoted and, and proposed and only one of them passed. Go ahead. Uh, Robert Fulton with the California Health Report. Uh, in your opening remarks, you both mentioned single payer. So I was wondering uh, how likely is it that we possibly move towards single payer, at least on the state level? And uh, do you see the ACA being a springboard or a speed bump towards single payer? So not not a on the record. You answer that one. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think that it's I don't think it's a roadblock. Uh, the question is, will we get there faster than we might have? I, I genuinely think that a single-payer system is where the United States should be. The problem is, why aren't we there, and how long will it take to get there? And so I can imagine a scenario where the ACA accelerates movement towards a, towards a single-payer. It's similar, and, and Bob was touching on it in his remarks. This, I feel like this is our last attempt to patch up the gaps in the current system. We have a quilted sort of patchwork financing insurance system, private insurance for most people through their place of employment, Medicare, Medicaid, but for a limited number. Now we've, the ACA is the big Band-Aid. It expands Medicaid and makes it income-based, not categorical eligibility. That should have been done from the beginning, but was impossible in 1965. We're doing it, but there's enormous resistance to that. And that's why 25 states have not moved forward. Um, and we're fixing the market where people don't get insurance through their place of employment and making it fairer. 
and we're providing subsidies. So I feel like this is the last attempt to maintain, in a sense, the status quo, leave most of the market and most insurance alone, and sort of fill in the gaps as much as possible. Um, and I think it will work. But it's not universal access. And it will accelerate some of these other issues, and the one, one of which was what I referred to before about the fact that we still have a system where private insurance pays here, Medicare pays here, Medi-Cal or Medicaid pays here, and uninsured patients, and there'll still be uninsured patients, are paying somewhere down here. And what we don't know is where does covered California or the exchange policies fit on this spectrum. But we've got not a two-tiered system. We've got, in my opinion, a four- or five-tiered system. And to me, that is not a formula for a fair and equitable health care system. It's a, it perpetuates the kind of disparities, the kind of strategic marketing, the kind of targeting the most exclusive, the, the you know, I can see the large group, well-insured population as emerging as the most desirable part of the marketplace. And, you know, doctors in areas like Beverly Hills and the West Side, um, who I meet, who say, you know, I don't really want to take any public insurance. And they consider policies in covered California to be public insurance, even though it's private. So I could see that accelerating uh, uh, the movement towards a single payer because I don't see how we eliminate this tremendous disparity in what insurers are paying for the same care uh, and creating these kinds of in persistent inequities based on what my insurance company pays for my care. Okay. Well, you know, Maryland's had the model for over 40 years, and there were actually, um, uh, uh, back in the 70s, four states, including Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Maryland, who had um, all-payer systems where all the insurers paid the same amounts. Uh, and the other three states abandoned their all-payer systems when Medicare went to its fixed payment system because they all realized they could make more money by participating in the new Medicare payment system than their old system. So they abandoned that approach. Um, you know, it's one of the uniquely American sort of features of our healthcare system, which is that it can go, it, we can all acknowledge that it's broken. It's not serving everyone as well as it could. It's inefficient relative to other nations. And yet somehow we continue to plow along and uh, n you know, not insist that we fix this fundamentally broken system. Hi, uh, Patrick Boyle from the Forum for Youth Investment. Uh, I'm wondering if either of you can just tell us what's your elevator pitch, three or four sentence answer to an average American who says, all right, the law passed almost four years ago. How is the country better off today? can't be denied health insurance if you have a pre-existing condition. If you lose your health insurance through your place of employment, you can be guaranteed to get insurance and, and to qualify for a subsidy. Um, and those are the Kid, two kids things. Kids up to age 26? Kids up to age 26 can stay on their parents' policy, regardless of whether they're financially dependent. Would you add those would be my big three. Dr. Ross, would you add anything else? Uh, I think f if I'm talking to an average, like a, you know, you're. Tell me who hasn't bought the under under. Yeah. Why is, tell me, and I get the point. Yeah. I had a daughter, I, I, daughter who was benefiting from the 26 thing for a while, but then yeah. they all age out of that at some point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, but I, I, I'm just, and I'm asking because. I, Personally, I supported the law, but from as a neutral observer, I can understand why people are frustrated because yeah. you don't have one thing that says this, we're better off today. A lot of what you're pointing to is individual. If, if I don't lose my job, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we always felt, uh, uh, at, at least at the California Endowment, that that the best messaging was to get people enrolled. That that you know, ha having having 
Um, and, and this is where particular, well, for Americans generally, um, because you know we're a living room, dining room culture, right? And so um, talking to someone and meeting someone who has benefited from it in your own family or a neighbor down the street is gonna be better than any ad campaign or any, right? Um, and in particular, in particular for ethnic communities, um, where it doesn't surprise me that the uptake has been slower because Ethnic communities, um, for sure African-American, for sure uh, Latino. Um, it's still, I'm still scratching my head as why Asia Pacific Islanders, at least in California, I'm not sure about the national data, are doing better. Um, we need to sort of figure out how that happened. Um, it surprised me. Because ethnic communities tend to be, they're not just message communities, they're really messenger communities. Like, like you know, is, is there a trusted messenger that's telling me about yes. this. And, and the trust thing is a big deal, um, particularly in, in ethnic communities. And the more immigrant they are, the, the bigger trust becomes sort of an issue. And so I always felt that, that would be, there would be a lag time in getting them up and, and in. Um, but that's why we've, I've been, we've been a rabid about enrollment, because the more folks got enrolled, yep. that was the best marketing campaign you could come up with, is just to get people enrolled. Before we I actually wanted to add to Bob's point there and actually share some information with him in his role as a board member on Covered California. So I've spoken uh, in literally over 100 community meetings over the last two years about the ACA. And I'm remembering one story from a woman who's a certified enrollment counselor, African-American woman, and talking about reaching her community and the successes and failures. And the one thing that she said was most frustrating was going door to door because um, people d did not want to hear about this and did not want to hear about a government program that was going to help them. And she mentioned that um, she goes home, when she's doing the door-to-door -door work that she goes home uh, a lot of nights and cries into her prayer pillow um, because she's so frustrated trying to help her community. Mm -hmm. And yet she's also working with pastors to get the message out and you know, reported a very much more success in that venue because of the trusted messenger. And it occurred to me that it may be that um, covered California in supporting these efforts and, and your uh, foundation as well, uh, maybe should be steering people away from the door-to-door -door sales because people are getting the doors slammed in their face. Um, and not because they've got a bad message or they're, they're not doing their job well, but it's, it's they're not going to, to reach the people that they re desperately want to meet or, or reach. And um, a couple more questions. Yes, and then before we finish, even though it's against my purposes because I want to save all the good stories for me, I would love to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear if you if there are any stories you feel like are not being told that uh, this room full of reporters should be telling. But please, go ahead. Um, fast forward a few years, um, most of the Obamacare shakeout has subsided. And it's working fairly well. But there is a backlash against the law. And we have a Republican Congress, Republican president. The law is repealed. How would you envision something like that happening? I mean, would you'd probably have half the states, states that have had a Medicaid expansion, close to a universal health care level. You have a sort of a Mason-Dixon line. The states that haven't done the Medicaid expansion yeah. still have fairly large uninsured people. Does, does Obamacare reach a point of no return where it can't essentially be repealed? It's fixed. Enrollment, enrollment, enrollment. Um, yeah. Number one. Number two, um, young people enrolling. Because the ma the math doesn't work if only sick people enroll, right? So um, that that would be the fastest way to get the single payer in California, anyway. Is is if the math doesn't work and, and insurance companies start bailing because of the um, the, the, the risk selection and, and the pool. Um, you know, politically, I, I guess um, you know we've just seen so much of a horror show on this politically that. Um, B both putting on my covered California hat as well as my, my California endowment hat. Um, and um, this is going to sound 
not terribly introspective, but it, it's kind of the way you have to operate, right? Which is um, y you analyze, you work really hard, you try and execute, and then you pray, <laughs> right? Be because the, the politics sort of we can't control, <laughs> right? We can't control it. So uh, it's not that I don't worry about it. But, but I'm not trying to worry about that at the expense of, of getting enrollment up in California. We've got to get the numbers up. And so we think the best way to immunize against, against a Republican takedown, let's say the Republicans get the House and the Senate and the White House, and now you're looking at politically, at least you, get, you, you can see a political path towards unraveling um, Obamacare. Um, the bet here is what immunizes against that is that enough people have enrolled that they revolt when you try and take something away from them. So, so that's, you know, that's the way you know, we, we come at this. And, and um, it, you know, my, my pastor defines faith as do what you got to do and leave the rest up to the Lord. So that's kind of where we're at. We just kind of do what we got to do and leave the rest up to the, to mm -hmm. the, to the gods or, or whatever. But um, I, I try not to. And then I have a, I, after Jerry goes, I have a comment about stories. Please. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I tend not to uh, spin those nightmare scenarios uh, because I want this law to succeed. Um, I sort of want to spend the last whatever part of my professional career working to, to build something rather than, and, and again, you know, this is not an, an easy process whatsoever. But uh, I know that there are people now who are, being paid to think about that nightmare scenario and to f find out how to make it happen, or working to make it happen. So I, 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 can't, I can't bring myself to, spend, to waste whatever precious remaining time I have in my professional life trying to anticipate what the, that group is going to do if they get a, in, into a position to do it, and then try to figure out what the counter move is going to be so many years down the road, because right now, that's not the case, and we need to build and implement this program as successfully as possible. So uh, I, I don't even allow myself to go there. Having said that, um, I think that the key may not be the individuals who enroll, because I can imagine a Republican president who openly says, well, it's too bad that 25 million Americans are going to be uninsured next year when we repeal Obamacare, but they didn't vote for me anyway. So, too bad. I mean, it's what Mitt Rom Romney said when he didn't realize he was being videotaped. So, I think those conversations are taking place, and I think that there's some Republican governor who'd be more than happy to be a hero to the Tea Party and the conservative movement in this country to say, I was the one who repealed this abomination. And if it costs 25 million Americans their health insurance, that's the price of freedom. Yeah, and so, this was, I mean, and that was the political calculus. You know, um, it was, you know, very much, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible term to you, but it's the best metaphor. Um, uh, I, I have, you know, this, you know, strangle the baby in the crib. Get get you know kill the ACA before anyone benefits from it. Yeah. Because once people benefit from it, it becomes the political calculus becomes you know very different. Which is why you know some years ago, and it's been a while, I visited France, um, a trip I would all recommend uh, to look at their healthcare system. <laughs> and 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 and, and it was and the wine and and and, <laughs> and, um, and and it was it was interesting. I don't know whether France has, has anyone been to France lately to, to look at yes. the healthcare system. I don't yes, think they I still have. have this provision. It was fascinating because um, they had a number of things that, that support prevention and wellness, right, built into the system, built into the, the, the economics of the system. And among them was if you were a pregnant woman and you, and you showed up for your, once you got pregnant, you showed up on your, for your prenatal care appointment sort of on time and in the rhythm of the prenatal appointment, you got a check. And I don't know if they still do that, um, but this was back in the 90s they did. And it was interesting because it wasn't means tested. I thought, when I first heard that, I said, oh, that's great. Poor women get reimbursed for going, oh, no, 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 no. It's not for poor women, it's everybody. 
So it didn't matter whether you were the equivalent of Donald Trump's wife or a poor Algerian immigrant. You got a, you got a check from the French whatever uh, system if you did your prenatal care appointments on time. And I said, boy, that's interesting and really different. Why do you do it like that? And the answer from the French um, health minister was a woman. She said, well, if, if it's, if it, basically what she said was, if it's a universal benefit, it's harder to dismantle. You can't take it away, yeah. right? Um, and, so, and so rather than sort of just a means-tested or program just for the poor, it was uh, considered for everyone. And it was sort of part of this French ethos of, of, you know, we want all of our French babies to, you know, be healthy. Now, again, I don't know. There's a lot of time between now and then. I don't know if they yeah. still do that. But I was fascinated to, to hear that. It's just very different than anything we would do here in the United States. Story ideas. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mixed families, um, particularly uh, immigrant families yep. where, y you know, you have three children and a family and one, you know, one or two are undocumented and one was born here. And so, you know, you just have a household of folks who are eligible for Obamacare and maybe one's eligible for Obamacare and one's eligible for Medi-Cal and another one is undocumented eligible for nothing. Yeah. So sort yeah. of what, you know, what's the dynamic in that household when you have these um, very different um, uh, kinds of stories? Mm -hmm. um, mo you know, the, the, the stories of sort of following, um, and I think, I think um, Drew Altman and Kaiser um, Family Foundation are taking this approach, but uh, in fact, we may even be paying for some of it. You are, we and are. we are writing you're doing those it? stories. Oh, you're writing the right. stories, okay. Right. Which are, you know, just follow families over time uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, from uninsuredness to what happens. insured, or what happens, right? Yeah. So that, that's another. Um, third is uh, uh, what happens, and this is a longer term story, but what happens to the traditional safety net in an era of Obamacare? What happens to a THE clinic? Yes. When, because of cost-bending curve stuff, there, uh, and this is, gets kind of weedy, but the, 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 the um, fee-for-service, uh, what's that payment called system they have, Jerry? The, the uh, PPS. Get, the PPS system right. that, that's sort of been carrying the clinics, that begins to go away. What happens at a safety net hospital that's been getting the dish payment, the disproportionate share payment, that thing goes away. What happens to them? Case in point, St. Francis Hospital in uh, Linwood, Linwood, uh, which is a daughter's a charity hospital. Daughters having some financial issues, getting ready to do a fire sale for their hospitals, and St. Francis is one of them. And St. Francis is a major, 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 major um, uh, safety net provider for South Los Angeles. What happens if that hospital gets sold to a for-profit place or just get closed down? Right now we're at Martin Luther King all over again. Right um, down the street. Yeah. So Prim Ready, yeah, you know, Prim Ready comes in, and 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 you know what what happens at that place. So uh, those are quick ones off the top of yeah. my head. But I'm so um, I, other thing that I know that we talk about a lot uh, in in my group is sort of the employer effects as well, because you know some of the provisions for employers have been delayed a year, and then others for for two years, and. I know that the negative stories are going to be written, but you know what are the success stories and what are the and just the balance. I mean, there's going to be positive and negative consequences. Uh, I think related to the Affordable Care Act, but uh, employers that today do not offer insurance, what are they going to do? Are they going to pay penalties or are they going to start offering insurance? Um, what's going to happen to uh, uh, employers when they stop offering coverage to part-time workers? Uh, we've already heard, for example, Whole Foods say that they're going to do that. And they explained that they're doing this primarily because they think their part-time workforce is going to be better off. Um, if they um, uh, don't offer them insurance, um, then they'll be eligible for subsidies, whereas if they offered it to them and they turned it down, they would not be eligible to go into the exchange. So I think you know, these kinds of employer effects are going to be interesting to document um, because there are going to be stories on both sides. I mean, there are going to be employers who are saying, and I, again, in the community meetings, um, have 
encountered some of the workers who said, my hours were cut from 35 to 28 because my company doesn't want to provide health insurance benefits to us. And those, unfortunately, are going to happen. Um, but, you know, I think that we need to shine some light on that as well because, you know, one thing that as much as I wish that that wasn't happening, uh, shining a light on it helps bring, I think, uh, if nothing else, some attention to the magnitude, who's being affected, and um, uh, whether or not this, sort of what the magnitude of the problem is, what industries is it occurring in. Uh, and this may lead to further legislative action in California. It may not change the ACA, but you know, California's legislature has demonstrated that it's willing to go beyond what's in the ACA law uh, to deal with some of the consequences. And there may be other legislation that flows as a result. You make a good point, and maybe one that we should end on, is that I think it is incumbent upon us and those of us who are writing about the Affordable Care Act to both write the sexy failure stories, but also the success stories, because both of these types of stories highlight the changes that are happening and tectonic changes that are happening in the healthcare system that we are living and we are living through. One other uh, plug uh, is, f is to keep the highly vulnerable population of Californians and Americans in mind. And I'll give you some, some examples. So uh, the young woman or young man who is just coming out of the foster care system, okay? Um, uh, those who do work around young women in, in, in um, sexual trafficking, human trafficking, one of the be biggest feeder systems for women who are sexually trafficked, foster care. Okay? Um, the young man who's 22 years old uh, is released from Central count from the county central jail or from Donovan State Prison, and uh, was in with mental health and substance abuse issues, and is now out. What happens? You know, in, in an era of Obamacare, um, uh, the, does he or, or she get you know the kind of care um, that he or she needs? I, I mentioned um, the undocumented, um, you know, the homeless person who's at, at Seventh and, and San Pedro who's duly diagnosed. Um, in theory, in an era of Obamacare, uh, unless you're undocumented, you know, the, we, now, we, we now should be able to cover and get mm -hmm. services to that person, but is that right. really happening? To what extent is it and why not? And through the lens of, of you know, a powerful story. So uh, I, I would, my two, if I could urge you to pick a population or, or to focus on it, you know, who are the, who are the most vulnerable that have, were already marginalized, stigmatized, and hurt pre-Obamacare. And Obamacare offers, an era of Obamacare offers a promise, a promise of getting uh, folks those, the services they need, but does that really happen? Well, thank you so much to both of our panelists. Thank and you. as you can see, they're very press friendly, so reach out. Thank you. Thank you.